Good afternoon, and thank you all for holding. Your lines have been placed on a listen-only mode until the question and answer portion of today's conference. I would like to remind all parties the call is now being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Helen Tally McRae. Thank you. You may begin. Hi. Thank you, Alon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Helen Tally McRae, and I work in the One Health Office of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health Updates call. Excuse me. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to remind everyone that although the content of these calls is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals, in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates on this conference call. Therefore, please exercise discussion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality during these calls cannot be guaranteed. Finally, today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Free continuing education is available for ZOHU calls. Detailed instructions are available on our website, cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu, and will be given at the end of this call. Please spread the word to your colleagues about the zohu call and this new free CE opportunity. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interest or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias and the presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept any commercial support for this activity. Before we turn the call over to our speakers today, we'd like to share some One News, One, sorry, One Health News updates with you. Dr. Barton Barabash, you may begin when you're ready. Thanks, Helen. Hi, everyone. This is Casey barton Baravesh, the director of CDC's One Health Office. And first, I'd like to welcome all the new participants to today's ZOHU call. And I'd like to thank all of you for helping us spread the word about the ZOHU call and letting your colleagues know that we now offer CE. Our ZOHU call audience is really growing, and we now have over 4,100 subscribers representing a variety of One Health partners at different levels, federal, state, and local, as well as colleagues and professionals from non-governmental organizations, industry, and academia. So please continue to share the Zohu Call website with information on how to subscribe to the Zohu Call, and we greatly appreciate your continued support and in increasing awareness about the call and the free CE opportunity. So to kick us off today, I'd like to share the latest One Health news and resources, and all of these have links included in today's Zohu Call email reminder. First is CDC's new rapid rabies test could revolutionize testing and treatment and is the topic of today's first presentation. We've included a link to that new paper. USDA APHIS has updated its animal welfare regulations to provide certain small-scale dealers and exhibitors with additional exemptions from licensing requirements. There are three new steps in the fight against global antimicrobial resistance that were updated recently at the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE, general session held in Paris. And they've also released the results of their 2018 photo competition winners with some beautiful photos, including some representing the Americas region. We've also included a link to some video presentations for two recent events. CDC's Public Health Grand Round called Be Antibiotics Aware, Smart Use, Best Care, and also to a symposium on the 1918 pandemic influenza. 
We've included some links to upcoming conferences and meetings that might be of interest. And again, you can check the news to see those. And we also wanted to share some highlights from recent publications, including that the June issue of the Emerging Infectious Diseases Journal has a zoonosis theme. World Bank has released a One Health operational framework. And there's a new article on Zika virus shedding in semen of symptomatic infected men. Highlighted MMWR topics include malaria, outbreaks associated with treated recreational water, Lyme, de sur Lyme disease surveillance, and summaries of salmonella outbreaks, one linked to ball python exposure, and another to the consumption of rattlesnake pills. There are also a few current outbreaks under investigation, and we highlight those a multi-state outbreak of Salmonella enteritidis linked to pet guinea pigs, a multi-state outbreak of Salmonella brandrup infections linked to shell eggs, and a multi-state outbreak of E. coli 0157H7 infections linked to romaine lettuce. As always, a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases is available on the Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. Lastly, if you would like for us to share news from your organization or if you want to suggest presentation topics or volunteer to present on a future Zohu call, please contact us at zohucall at cdc.gov. Thank you again for your support of the Zohu call and for joining today. I'll now turn it back over to Helen. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Barton Barabesh. Our overall series objectives for Zohu call include um, describing two key points from each presentation, describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics, identify an implication for animal and human health, identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats, and identify two new resources from CDC partners. We have three very interesting presentation topics for you today. Rabies diagnosis in animals using PCR. Um, excuse me one second, no back one slide. Okay, um, National Pet Week and trends in reported vector-borne disease cases. You'll find resources and links for each presentation in today's Zohu Call reminder email. Questions may be typed into the Q&A box in Adobe Connect. Please name um, the presenter or topic at the beginning of each question you type in. If you're using the phone line, press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. You, we will have time for questions at the end of the call. Okay, our first presentation, Rabies Diagnosis in Animals Using PCR, will be given by Dr. Crystal Gigante. Dr. Gigante, you may begin when you're ready. Good afternoon. I am Crystal Gigante, a member of the Molecular Diagnostics Team in the Pox Virus and Rabies Branch at CDC. Today I'm happy to give a short presentation on postmortem diagnosis of rabies in animals using PCR. The objectives of this presentation are to introduce the strengths, weaknesses, and critical considerations when using PCR, to compare PCR-based rabies tests to the gold standard in rabies diagnostics, and to describe the LM34 assay, a PCR test developed at CDC. Rabies is a global threat. Most of the nearly 60,000 human deaths caused by rabies each year are associated with exposure to a rabid dog. Across the world, canine rabies and wildlife rabies are being targeted by vaccination campaigns. A good understanding of rabies burden is critical when organizing and evaluating the success of vaccination campaigns. And being able to accurately and reliably identify rabies cases is critical to prevent rabies in exposed humans. An integrated approach to rabies management includes accurate surveillance and diagnosis of rabies in animals. The gold standard in rabies diagnosis in animals is the direct fluorescent antibody test, known as the GFA or FAT. It is sensitive, 
specific, reliable, and robust. It does not miss positive rabies cases, which is critical because missing a positive can result in death that could have been prevented. The DSA does have several limitations. The use and availability of antibody conjugates is not standardized across labs, and conjugates can vary from batch to batch. The interpretation of results can also be difficult. The DSA test uses a fluorescence microscope, and the ability to distinguish nonspecific fluorescence from true signal requires hands-on training and experience. And lastly, the DSA requires fresh frozen tissue and maintenance of cold chain from the location where the sample is collected to the testing facility, which can be expensive and impractical in some areas. The requirement for fresh frozen tissue leaves many samples unfit for rabies testing. So how does PCR compare? The sequences and concentrations of primers and probes are standardized and can be produced commercially by many companies. There is less hands-on time to do a PCR assay. Many labs across the globe are already using PCR to detect other pathogens and diseases, and adding a rabies PCR test is easy and requires minimal training in these labs. The results are very easy to interpret. Uh, and lastly, there are commercial reagents for preserving RNA at room temperature that can eliminate the need for cold chain. Some of the weaknesses of PCR include its high sensitivity, which makes it prone to false positives due to contamination of samples or improper lab technique. As you may suspect, PCR or real-time PCR machine is required, but this machine can be used for other diagnostics. And lastly, PCR is only approved as a confirmatory diagnostic test for postmortem rabies in animals. However, PCR is being included as a primary test in the newly revised rabies chapter of the OIE manual, and this update should be reflected shortly on their website. Other groups are considering similar changes. So there are many PCR assays out there, and they fall into three major categories, reverse transcription PCR or RT-PCR, the other two types are real-time or quantitative RT-PCR, using either CyberGreen dye or a TACMAN probe to detect the rabies virus RNA. Each type of PCR test has its own advantages and disadvantages. Consider these main points when choosing a PCR assay to use for rabies. One, has it been validated to detect all viruses that cause rabies? And two, how does it perform compared to the DSA? Any rabies diagnostic test should be able to detect all viruses that cause rabies because of global travel, the risk of rabies from other areas is never completely avoidable. Not all PCR assays are made the same. Make sure the test you're using has been validated using diverse samples. The LM34 assay, a TACMAN real-time RT-PCR assay developed at CDC, can detect all known lysoviruses. The primers and probes used in the LM34 assay target highly conserved regions of the genome, shown here in this figure. So how does a PCR assay compare to the DSA? Here's data from 14 labs across the world who participated in a pilot study comparing the LM34 assay to the DSA. For almost 3,000 samples tested, the LM34 had great diagnostic sensitivity and specificity. No DSA positive samples were negative by LM34. During the pilot study, the LM34 assay helped to identify 10 false positive DSA results from one laboratory and one false negative DFA result. The LM34 assay was also able to provide definitive results for 80 out of 81 DFA inconclusive results.
An important thing to remember when implementing a rabies PCR assay is that you must follow rabies sample collection guidelines, similar to what is done for the DFA. The minimum tissue acceptable to rule out rabies is a full cross-section of brainstem and cerebellum. One advantage of PCR is that practically any tissue can be tested to confirm rabies, including formalin fixed tissue, anti-mortem samples, and severely deteriorated specimen. This image shows unilateral rabies virus spread in a large animal, highlighting the importance of testing a full cross-section of brainstem instead of just a piece. This is the only tissue that um, is required to rule out rabies. As I mentioned earlier, PCR assays have very high sensitivity. The LM34 assay can detect RNA in positive clinical samples that have been diluted one million times. Therefore, the utmost care must be taken to avoid cross-contamination, especially in labs unfamiliar with molecular techniques. Not sure what happened there. I've lost visual on the slides. Um, Crystal, I can uh, advance them for you if you need for me to do that. Um, I see they're still moving. Um, so okay. I just have blank slides. Okay. So, um, so the one that I see now, it says um, a positive and a negative control must be included in each assay run. Is that the one you'd like to okay. start over with? Um, Okay, yes, so we can start here. PCR tests can incorporate several built-in controls. The first control measures host RNA levels. Sorry, Sorry. I, oh. I think somebody else was moving the, the are you um, moving the slides too? So, <clears throat> okay, I'm back on the one that says a positive and a negative control. That. Okay, can you go to the one just before that one? Yes. Thank you. Great, each sample must be tested. Yes, thank you. Correct. Okay, just tell me next slide and I'll just continue for you. Thank you. Thanks. PCR tests can incorporate several built-in controls. The first control measures host RNA levels. This control helps distinguish true negative samples from negative results caused by sample degradation, sample insufficiency, failed extraction, or PCR inhibition. Next slide. Positive and negative controls help ensure the assay is working properly. Positive controls allow labs to monitor assay performance over time and identify issues and abnormal assay runs. Negative controls can identify some forms of contamination. Next slide. I mentioned earlier that PCR assays can be easy to interpret. Here are the guidelines for result interpretation for the LM34 assay. Positive samples produce smooth amplification curves as shown in the bottom of this slide. These curves are given a cycle threshold value based on PCR machine analysis. The cycle threshold value is used to determine whether a sample is positive, negative, or needs further testing using the table shown in the middle of the slide. Next slide. As an added bonus, in addition to identifying a positive sample, the PCR product produced by the LM34 assay can be sequenced for low resolution rapid typing. Next slide. And I would like to thank all of the people at CDC and the labs that participated in the pilot study, and thank you for listening. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Gigante. Our next presentation AVMA National Pet Week, A Lifetime of Love, will be given by Dr. Emily patterson Kane. Dr. patterson Kane, you may begin when you're ready. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a bit of a change of pace, but I would like to explain today how the AVMA National Pet Week is actually a One Health program. 
and it particularly addresses the role of attachment within a One Health system. So attachment to ideas and to places and to other individuals really drives behaviour that is very important for One Medicine and One Welfare. And so that's why we place one of our main programs that um, is devoted to the treatment of companion animals within a One Health context. And it's why a person like myself, as a, as a psychologist, is employed in the animal welfare division to try and impact the way that people interact with animals. So the National Pet Week is in the first week of May. Uh, it's a long-standing program. I have the full details on the slide here. But the most important thing to point out is that National Pet Week is about the human companion animal bond. And it's encouraging pet owners to follow expert advice on responsible pet ownership. Uh, we have a lot of programs that are underneath this initiative that veterinarians and veterinary technicians, different groups in the community and charities can use to create a really fun message to say, well, you're motivated to be with your pets, to have a good time, and you love them. Um, but that this love comes with a responsibility because of the way it impacts the health of other people and animals and the environment. If you want to look at the underpinning of our program that uh, occurs each year, the policy to look at is the guidelines for responsible pet ownership. For a long time, we didn't have a specific policy on what you should do in relation to companion animals. We had a tendency to focus on the things that you should not do or things that are going wrong. But within a, a One Health mantra, the idea is if people focus in on how the system should work and how they should behave, that really helps organize a more positive and convincing way to explain a proper way to interact with animals. At the beginning of this policy, it outlines that owning a pet is a privilege and that it should be mutually beneficial as a relationship. So a pet owning relationship is not exploitative, it's positive. And this positivity goes out from the primary relationship to other members of the community and the environment. Making sure that our companion animals are contributing positively within this entire One Health framework. What we do within the policy is outline the paradigm and also some very specific expectations for care and management of companion animals. And these evolve as we have new ways for conducting preventative care, for identifying animals and make sure they don't stray, they don't uh, breed uncontrollably, they're properly contained. And there are some evolving expectations around this as time goes on. And generally a higher standard associated with veterinary care having more advances and people having higher expectations for humane conduct and behaviour. At the moment, the theme of National Pet Week is a lifetime of love. Uh, it does evolve over time, but this one we've been working with for a few years now, promoting the healthy human-animal bond. And then secondary to that, the sub-messages which uh, relate to controlling disease and dog bite prevention and other negative outcomes for when this bond is not working properly. Uh, we have evolving daily themes and currently they're organised around the lifespan of the animal because it introduces this responsibility idea that when you choose an animal, you're making a commitment that this is the right animal, that they're going to benefit from being in your household and that you're committing to taking proper care of them throughout their lifespan. And so currently it's organised on these themes. They relate to pet selection, to early socialisation and training, to nutrition and exercise and your day-to-day -day management of an animal, uh, to preventative health care and going to see your veterinarian, the control of pet population and breeding, having plans for emergencies, including personal emergencies and also uh, larger scale disasters, so that you're as prepared as you can be to either shelter in place or evacuate or take other responses and then issues to do with ageing and euthanasia, currently looking at the adoption of older animals from shelters as the older animals tend to be neglected. You can see how this uh, program relates outward to other organisations and their programs which have other focuses in the community. So for example, recently the idea of 
people exercising, particularly with their dogs, uh, contributing to the walkable community under the Surgeon General's program, and the idea that when people are out and interacting with their communities, the community tends to be safer and there are more positive interactions between neighbours and different people in the community. And it generally contributes to good public health and community safety. Uh, there are human health benefits that come directly from exercising animals. This does include walking outside with dogs, but also, for example, providing good play and exercise for indoor cats so that they have a nice, enriched, happy environment, a good bond inside the home, and they're not depending on going outside for their exercise where they might have a negative effect on the environment and other animals. Uh, we also have uh, messages to do with workplace safety, with humane education of children, and the link, which is the concept that animals as victims of violence have connections with humans as victims of violence and abuse. And that when we can have cross-reporting and people who respond to these different target audiences training and working and communicating together, this causes a much more effective response to violence, to at-risk households, and to vulnerable people who may be showing antisocial behaviour and require some comp compassionate intervention. And so within this general framework, it sprouts off a lot of our more specific programs, of which there's actually quite a few. Uh, but I like the One Health idea and the strengthening the good, responsible attachment to animals, uh, particularly companion animals, and a different and appropriate response to other working agricultural wild animals. And it gives a, a positive angle to trying to reinforce the correct behaviour rather than focusing entirely on stamping out the bad behaviour. And the good behaviour over time becomes more acceptable, tends to crowd out the bad behaviour. And a good example of this is the issue of assistance animal fraud, which we're seeing a lot, for example, in relation to the behaviour of animals being brought into airlines and transportation and other areas. Uh, Presenting assistance animal fraud really requires engaging with different parts of the system. Just trying to stamp out the fraud can cause some inappropriate challenging of people with disabilities who are making appropriate use of a service or emotional support animal. We like to avoid that. We want to strengthen the, the care provided to assistance animals, including by veterinarians, and coordinating the care between the handler of the animal their health professional and their veterinary professional uh, so that those animals are appropriate and they're being prescribed in an appropriate way and everyone is educated about the different legal categories of animals and their rights. We really want to support access for pet owners also, uh, for example, to accommodation so that they have less of a motivation to either wishful thinking or deliberately misrepresent their animal that is, is a companion animal as a service or emotional support animal. And through these coordinated programs create social norms that celebrate the assistance animals and the companion animals and discourage people from trying to move their animals inappropriately from one category to the other. If you're interested in this program it's at avma.org backslash assistance animals and we have a interdisciplinary working group that's working on coordinating medical and veterinary professionals as well as social work in some other areas to strengthen uh, some appropriate systems of managing these animals. Another smaller case, uh, vehicular heat stroke, so that's animals, particularly dogs, that are left in cars in the summer. We're coming into that season now. It's a persistent problem, causes harm and death to animals. It's also extremely distressing to the human caretakers and to other people who come across it. And it causes a lot of conflict and, and disagreement in some communities. And as we've looked into this, we've determined, unlike most forms of abuse, cases of heat stroke are often driven by there being a human-animal bond. And this is what motivates the person to bring the animal with them. They, they're often an older animal and well cared for and there's been a failure of understanding rather than a failure to care about the animal. And this brings out that just because people might feel love for other people, animals, and the environment doesn't necessarily 
mean that they will show the right behaviours. So the person loves the animal and then brings it with them into a place where it's in danger of heat stroke and death. So we're redirecting our materials based on uh, a study of this area uh, so that they are less confronting and dramatic, which cause loving uh, pet owners to believe those messages don't apply to them because they would never hurt their animal. And the new message that says, if you love us, leave us at home, folds this information into travel preparation rather than as an abuse message that loving pet owners are going to tend to ignore, assuming it doesn't apply to them. And then finally, uh, dog bite prevention. Just before National Pet Week, we have National Dog Bite Prevention. We have a document, Dog Bite Prevention, a community response, which pushes a, a responsible community approach of education, legislation, and enforcement. Uh, it includes key messages, again, that have to do with responsible ownership and that are correlated with animals being less likely to be involved in dog bite which is uh, neutering, socialisation, vaccination and essentially being in control of what your dog is doing and who they are hanging out with. Uh, this competes with the more isolated messages like breed specific approaches, which tend to focus down on I don't like this and I want it to stop, rather than how is the overall system of people, animals and the environment spinning off this unintended problem and how do we change that entire system or to reduce that negative outcome. So the main outcomes we're looking for are safety for people and animals in their communities. And you can see how having a, a multi-system approach brings in different partners and allows us to work across different parts of the problem. So we have the United States Postal Service, postal carriers being um, people who often have a problem with dog attacks insurance companies who don't particularly want to be paying out after attacks, humane association looking at the welfare of the animals, uh, and uh, Victoria still well involved in animal training. So in summary, National Pet Week promotes responsible pet ownership and it does it within a holistic system, very much acknowledges the One Health approach and specifically the role of attachment within that approach and the subset of the attachment between people and their companion animals and how you manage the way that attachment motivates different behaviours, human behaviours like responsible pet ownership behaviours, animal behaviours like aggression and propensity to bite, and tries to improve the overall system. The idea being that this identifies and engages all of the stakeholders and encourages an understanding of the larger picture and more effective responses, and responses that are positive and engaging rather than negative and blame-based. And it promotes improvements that benefit all stakeholders, not only limited to our members or even the veterinary profession, but the larger community. So the human companion animal bond is, as far as the AVMA is concerned, an important part of One Health and responsible pet ownership is a key message for the protection and promotion of mutually beneficial interactions between people and their animals. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patterson Kane. Our final presentation, Trends in Reported Sector-Borne Disease Cases, United States and Territories, 2004 to 2016, will be given by Dr. Ben Beard. Dr. Beard, you may begin when you're ready. Thanks, Helen. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're calling in from. Um, what I'll be doing in the, in the next few minutes is uh, reviewing the findings of a recently published report on trends in reportable vector-borne disease cases in the U.S. and territories from 2004 through 2016. And um, this report is part of the CDC Vital Signs Series, and it was published on May 4th um, in the MMWR, uh, in case you didn't uh, see this when it came out. 
So uh, we've seen an alarming increase in the number of reported cases of, of vector-borne diseases. In fact, between 2004 and 2016, there were more than 640,000 cases of vector-borne diseases that were, were, were reported in the U.S. And uh, the number of reported cases of diseases from mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, um, and fleas have tripled over that period of time. And um, another interesting finding in, uh, overall is that tick-borne diseases actually accounted for over 75% of all reported vector-borne disease cases. Mosquito-borne disease uh, epidemics happen more frequently than they did over previous time periods. And the reported data substantially underestimates the actual number of disease cases. And this uh, ranges anywhere from eight, full, eight to tenfold in the case of Lyme disease to approximately sevenfold in the case of uh, um, arboviral diseases such as West Nile virus infection. Both uh, new agents and never before, uh, no, never before seen agents were also uh, documented in this report. As all of you know, chikungunya and Zika, though we've seen them before, uh, these caused outbreaks in the United States for the first time. And, um, and also there were seven new tick-borne disease agents that were shown to infect people. Uh, these seven included uh, heartland virus, Bourbon virus, um, Borrelia miyamotoi infection, Borrelia maonii, Rickettsia parkeri, Rickettsia species 364D, and Ehrlichia muris alclearensis. And um, in terms of um, of the drivers behind these, the study didn't really go into that in great detail, but uh, certainly more people are at risk today, and this is due in part to global commerce, uh, which moves mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas around the world. And, uh, you know, a good case of that, a good example of that very recently is the introduction of Haemophysalis longicornis, uh, the exotic uh, tick species in uh, eastern U.S., uh, and this probably suggests uh, recently that this may go back a few years ago, actually, when it was introduced, even though it was just recently uh, documented. Um, secondly, infected travelers can introduce and spread novel pathogens across the world, and uh, this is certainly the case in what we saw with Zika virus, the introduction into the new world. And then finally, mosquitoes and ticks move diseases, uh, disease agents into new areas of the United States, causing more people to be at risk. And uh, this is certainly the case uh, that we've seen with um, with Exodi scapularis transmitted diseases. We've seen a huge expansion in Exodi scapularis uh, distribution over the last 20 years. And with that, we've seen the expansion of uh, Lyme disease um, and, and a number of other um, pathogens that are transmitted by this, this tick vector. Vector-borne disease cases have been reported uh, by um, all states in, in the U.S. And um, according to how you break this up, there are either 16 or 17 reportable vector-borne diseases in the U.S. And, um, of course, and that has to do with what, um, the fact that over this period of time, early on, anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis were combined. And, of course, now those are uh, broken apart. But for mosquito-borne diseases, there are uh, nine that are reportable. These are California serogroup viruses, chikungunya, dengue, Eastern equine encephalitis virus, uh, malaria, St. Louis encephalitis virus, um, West Nile virus, yellow fever virus, and Zika. For tick-borne diseases, it includes um, anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis, babesiosis, Lyme disease, Poisson virus, spotted fever rickettsiosis, and tularemia. And then uh, for flea-borne diseases, there's only one of those that's actually reportable, as you, as you all would know, and that's uh, plague caused by Yersinia pestis. So um, this slide shows the way that um, the disease reported cases have increased over time. This is a simple bar graph. And um, you, know, you can see in 2004 there were 27,388 cases. In 2016 there were 96,075 uh, cases. Of course, 2016 was um, greatly affected by the Zika virus outbreak. And, um, but what's not shown in this slide um, 
is um, underreporting due to um, related to Lyme disease, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the next slide. This next slide actually uh, breaks down the numbers of cases uh, by mosquito-borne versus flea-borne, and um, the light color bars show reported mosquito-borne cases in the United States. The uh, orange bars show the reported mosquito-borne disease cases in the U.S. territories. And then the um, greenish-blue uh, bars show the reported tick-borne disease cases in the United States. And as you can see that uh, particularly in territories, you can see how, chicken, how um, uh, Zika and chikungunya and dengue have uh, had an impact over the years. You can see that West Nile virus, uh, we have uh, bad years and not so bad years, so it's very episodic. And then you can see with uh, the tick-borne diseases that uh, we've seen this sort of insidious uh, increase in these uh, throughout the years. And one point I'll make, um, you can notice in the last three years, uh, those cases have, have flattened out a bit. And uh, this is largely due to surveillance artifact because in, in several states they've gone from um, uh, reporting actual number of, of cases to counting cases to conducting uh, surveys and estimates of cases. And so that's uh, resulted in probably 5,000 additional cases that have not been reported in the last two years, each per year in the last uh, two or three years. And uh, other states that have just been completely overwhelmed by Lyme disease reporting, and so this accounts at least in 2016 for probably for another uh, 2,000 cases. So, uh, so that curve actually should be uh, going up, uh, continuing to go up uh, pretty precipitously were it not for underreporting. This next slide shows the way that uh, the disease cases, uh, reported cases of mosquito-borne disease cases are distributed across the United States. And uh, the darker states are the top 20%, so these are more than 1,678 cases. The uh, um, sort of dark brown are the second 20%, and uh, this is um, you know, 1,100 to 1,600 cases. And uh, the third 20%, which is 545 to 1137, uh, and, um, and so forth. But the um, ma main points to make from this slide are that you can see the darkest states, these in, in, including the territories, Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, a lot of these cases relate to the recent Zika virus outbreak. You can see the cases in the central part of the United States, um, the uh, Dakotas, um, Nebraska, Minnesota, um, a lot of those are, are associated, Montana, those are associated with, um, with West Nile virus uh, cases that are, that are reported. And then, of course, you see that, that all of the states are, are affected one way or another uh, by mosquito-borne diseases. And uh, if you look at tick-borne diseases, you see there's a, a very different pattern. You also see that all states are affected. And uh, the darkest states really are the states where we see exotic scapularis transmitted uh, disease cases. So these are um, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, uh, Poisson virus, encephalitis, babesiosis uh, primarily. And um, so those are the states most heavily affected. In the central part of the U.S., uh, you see the darker states there. Those are primarily spotted fever, rickettsia, and um, ehrlichiosis that are transmitted respectively by uh, dermocenter ticks and by uh, amblyoma americanum. So, um, the other important point that the report makes, and it's very concerning to us, is that in our estimation, the U.S. is not fully prepared uh, for these uh, vector-borne disease problems. And, and we really have three different scenarios that we're faced with. We, we have the risk of exotic um, new uh, viruses like chikungunya and Zika. We also have the sporadic episodic um, outbreaks of diseases that are here in the United States, like West Nile virus, where you have really bad years, like in 2012, uh, followed by uh, years that aren't so bad. And, uh, but, but it calls for um, uh, 
infrastructure to be in place to be able to deal with those outbreaks, even though they may only be every five or six years. And then finally, we have this regular, huge, uh, concerning increase in tick-borne diseases. So it's really three different scenarios. And uh, what we've seen is that local and state health departments and vector control organizations face increasing demands to respond to these three different types of threats. Uh, more than 80% of vector control organizations report uh, needing improvement in, in one or more uh, of five core competencies uh, that, that I'll show you on the next slide. And this is some data that came out of uh, a NATO survey that uh, was recently published. And then finally, more proven and publicly accepted mosquito and tick control methods are needed to prevent and control these diseases. So the five core competencies, as are um, defined, are, first of all, monitoring and tracking mosquitoes and ticks locally. And this is conducting a basic vector surveillance. Uh, secondly, uh, to, to use this vector surveillance data to drive local decisions about vector control. So as opposed to just um, spraying on a weekly, monthly, uh, regular basis, uh, spraying or other types of, uh, of control that, that's implemented, actually using surveillance data to guide this so it can be done um, in, in the most effective manner. Thirdly is to have an action plan to kill mosquitoes and ticks at, at all life stages. So this is not just simply the biting and the adult stages of mosquitoes, but also larval stages and immature stages of ticks. And then uh, fourthly is to um, have the capacity to control vectors using multiple types of methods. And so this is something that we routinely call integrated pest management, or IPM. And um, this allows us to use pesticides in the most judicious methods uh, to ensure um, uh, the, uh, the, that resistance doesn't um, to make it um, to optimize the possibilities that resistance doesn't uh, evolve to these uh, compounds, and then finally and related to that is to conduct pesticide resistance testing uh, regularly to be able to guide um, again uh, the best decisions for control. So um, finally. Um, so the actions that state and local health departments can take include the following that you see on this slide. First of all, to build and sustain public health programs that test and track disease agents and the mosquitoes and ticks that transmit them. Um, and uh, secondly, to train vector control staff <clears throat> on five core competencies for conducting prevention and control activities. And then finally, to educate the public about how to prevent bites and control diseases spread by mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas in their communities. And actually, CDC is involved in all three of these activities, uh, working lo uh, closely. And uh, for example, for a number for for the second bullet there, uh, we have a number of programs that are available to help with this. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about that, uh, we also have a number of resources that are available at our website to to assist uh, with public education. So um, we'd be glad to share those links with you um, if you're interested. And um, I think I'll stop with that. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Beard. Um, I'm afraid it looks like we have not had our uh, Q&A uh, box working for folks on Adobe Connect during the call. Our um, tech is trying to uh, get that fixed. Um, so if you have a question, please um, press star 1 on your phone and uh, answer, uh, go ahead and leave your uh, name and say which uh, presenter that you're asking the question for. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read off the phone number, too, in case any of you are um, don't have that handy. Um, just one moment, I'll get that. Um, in the meantime, Alon, do you have uh, any questions yet? I'm showing no questions. As a reminder to ask a question, please press star 1. To, um, to call in, um, if you would call 800-593-8936. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. And uh, the participant 
passcode when you called in that number is 961-1836. Again, if you call 1-800-593-8936 and enter participant passcode 961-1836. I do have a few questions. Would you like to take them at this time? Great, thank you. Okay, our first question today is from Julia Murphy, and please state your affiliation. Uh, hi, this is Julia Murphy. I work for the Virginia Department of Health. I, I had a question for uh, Dr. Giante. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, the first speaker. Um, I was wondering if the CDC envisioned a, you know, a, a transition to PCR for uh, animal rabies testing and, you know, uh, a thought that they would develop standards and training like they have now for the DFA test. And then kind of as a follow-on to that, I didn't know if there was any data on how PCR compared to the direct rapid immunohistochemical test, which is a field test that's been used for a good while in this country as part of the ORV program. Thank you for your question. Um, so far as standardizing a protocol, we are working right now. There's a, a work group uh, with APHL considering a national protocol for PCR um, for the U.S. for rabies animal diagnostics. So that is currently being considered. Uh, it's also being evaluated by OIE and WHO. So we're hoping uh, hopefully this year we'll get some guidance from those groups uh, as to whether PCR can be implemented as a primary diagnostic, whether we envision a transition from DFA to PCR um, and getting rid of all DFA, I, I don't think that that's what we're looking to do. We're just looking to provide the option of PCR for primary testing for those labs that are interested, um, just because the PCR test that we have seems to perform just as well as the DFA. Uh, now, we haven't done a direct comparison with the DRIT, but comparing previous studies um, that have compared the DRIT to the DFA, it seems like they would be similar. Uh, the PCR assay has similar diagnostic specificity and sensitivity to the DFA test. So I can't answer that directly, but it should you should be able to compare the similarities between the DRIT and DSA to the PCR indirectly. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. I appreciate it. And as a reminder to ask a question, please press star 1. And our next question is from Lisa. And please state your affiliation. Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, my question is for Dr. Beard. And I had a question about the five core competencies for vector control. Um, I'm wondering if those competencies include somewhere uh, addressing environmental impacts of various um, control agents for mosquitoes and other vectors. And I bring this up because I had a recent conversation with um, a private company that comes around to yards and controls mosquitoes. And they told me that they had a product called Bifrinthrin, Bifrinthrin, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, that controls um, mosquitoes and is specific only to mosquitoes. And when I looked that up, I found that it was actually a pyrethroid that's highly toxic to bees, aquatic organisms. Um, so I feel like um, some of these private companies are not accurately being educated on the products that they're using, and I'm wondering if that will be a component um, in this larger competency plan. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, the survey that I cited, it's a Nature report, and they actually looked at about 10 different competencies. Five of these were their core competencies, as they called them, and, and there were five others that they looked at. And, um, and I'm trying to, I, I certainly can follow up with the call organizers and send the uh, link to this report. I don't, I, I'm looking for it right now. I don't have it in front of me to send it to you. But the question that you bring up actually is a really important question. And it's kind of, and the report only sort of scratched the, the surface of that. But, you know, we very are, we, we're very much concerned with, um, the um, uh, educational level of local vector control um, 
uh, companies, you know, and and there's a, a huge variation in this from uh, some of the large control companies that, such as you have there in Florida that that are incredibly professional, incredibly um, educated, you know, state of the arts, and um, and and then some that we have, especially in smaller towns in other parts of the U.S., uh, that are really just mom and pop type shop and someone has a part-time job, you give them a call and they come out and spray your yard for uh, ticks or mosquitoes or whatever. And so what we're doing to address that is that we've um, provided funding uh, to a couple of different partners. One is the, the, um, the American Mosquito Control Association, and so they developed a, an entire training program uh, that they are working on to be able to push this out, uh, a tra actually a train the trainer program. And, um, and this is to be able to educate uh, local pest controllers and, and even uh, city, county um, uh, pest controllers just um, and public health sanitarians on uh, how to, um, what are the most effective ways to control vectors, in, including educating them on different groups of, of compounds and how to use those and what their uh, side effects are and how to use them according to label and all that. Uh, we've also um, provided funding to the Entomological Society of America, and they have a couple of certificate programs that they offer, one for, for professional entomologists, uh, doctoral level people, but also one for pest control operators. And uh, these certificate programs are quite rigorous, and they allow this training. So we're working with NACHO and other partners to be able to make sure these tools are out there and available so that we can get better training of people at local levels who are, are so, that, so that they won't make the kind of mistakes that you you mentioned. Does that make sense? Um, yes, thank you. I, I would be interested in reading that report if it's somehow sent out to the group. Thank you. And once again, if you would like to ask a question. We have time for one more question. Okay. And as a reminder to ask a question, star one. One moment, please. I am showing no further questions at this time. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone who listened and for their questions. Thanks again to uh, today's speakers for their excellent presentation. To receive free continuing education credits for today's webcast, WC2962-060618, complete the evaluation at www.cdc.gov slash TCE online by July 2nd, 2018. A recording of today's call will be posted online on July 3rd, 2018 at www.cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash 2018 slash june dot html. To receive free continuing education credits for the web on demand, WD 2962-06 0618 video of today's call, complete the evaluation at www.cdc.gov slash TCE online by July 3rd, 2020. Detailed instructions for CE credits are available at www.cdc.gov slash One Health slash Zohu slash Continuing Education. So we'll take off uh, July. We don't have a call, so um, please join us for our next call on August the 1st at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. For more information, please visit cdc.gov slash onehealth slash Zohu. Please send suggestions and questions to zohucall at cdc.gov. Thanks again for your presentation, for participation <laughs> and presentation. Goodbye. Thank you, and this does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect.